Hello, and welcome to this presentation, which accompanies the review article, Goals in Practice, Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease Treatment and Management in the Primary Care Setting. I'm Dr. Barbara Yawn, a family physician, a researcher, and the Chief Scientific Officer of the COPD Foundation. I would like to take you through a case study, through the eyes and thoughts of a clinician when a patient comes to our office. Sarah is a 70-year-old woman who came in for a second opinion. She was diagnosed with COPD about three years ago, but despite treatment, was getting short of breath and had a persistent, often productive cough. She also found it more and more difficult to walk up just a few stairs. She looked tired and distressed and continually coughed during the intake process. Upon examination, her blood pressure was a little high. Otherwise, her vital signs and examination were pretty normal. When asked if she or anyone in her home smoked, Sarah told me that she used to, but quit about two years ago. No one else at home smoked either because her daughter just had a baby six months ago. I then checked whether Sarah was up to date on her immunization, and she was. She got a flu shot in the prior month and had gotten the pneumococcal vaccinations, which is recommended for people 65 years and older, a Tdap vaccine to protect her grandchild, and the two-dose shingles vaccine. Receiving influenza and pneumococcal vaccination reduces COPD exacerbation risk, so it's important to ensure that patients get all the recommended vaccines. According to Sarah, she's been taking a long-acting beta agonist, or LABA, and an inhaled corticosteroid all-in-one inhaler. She's not received any additional steroids or been hospitalized. I ordered a CBC with differential and performed a spirometry test here in my office because she'd not had one before. Spirometry is done to confirm a diagnosis of COPD. A post bronchodilator FEV1 to FVC ratio of less than 0.7 is confirmatory for COPD. Spirometry findings also help guide treatment decisions. However, it's not always ordered or performed in primary care settings when COPD is suspected. We'll talk about why I ordered the CBC with differential a little later. Sarah's post bronchodilator FEV1 to FEC ratio was 0.66, consistent with COPD. Other information we can get from spirometry includes the patient's level of airflow limitation. Based on an FEV1% predicted of 71%, Sarah has moderate COPD. It also highlights that the spirometry does not always reflect the symptom burden. According to the Global Initiative for Chronic Obstructive Lung Disease, or GOLD strategy, we should use history of exacerbations and symptom burden to classify patients as belonging to group A, B, C, or D. These group means are used to guide initial treatment decisions. But because Sarah has already been taking maintenance treatment, I follow the steps in the goals management cycle. Review symptoms and exacerbations, assess adherence to pharmacological and non-pharmacological treatments, and adjust treatment as needed. Sarah was getting short of breath even when climbing a few stairs. She also told me that she did not have any exacerbations, at least not in the last year. And when I asked her to demonstrate how she uses her inhaler, she used it properly. It's important to recognize that different types of inhaler devices require different preparation and maneuver steps. So providing patients with a resource, like the information on the COPD Foundation patient app, which is available free from the Apple App Store or Google Play, could help ensure proper inhaler techniques. Now let's move on to determine what treatment changes I could make to help control Sarah's symptoms. The LABA plus inhaled corticosteroid was obviously not working for her. 
So I used the flow chart for follow-up pharmacologic treatment provided in the gold strategy report to help adjust for treatment. Looking at the flow chart for dyspnea, I had two options for Sarah. Switch to dual bronchodilator therapy with a larva plus a long-acting muscarinic antagonist, or LAMA, or escalate to triple therapy with a LABA, a LAMA, and an inhaled corticosteroid. Inhaled corticosteroids are often overused in patients with COPD. They are not indicated in most patients and can increase the risk of a number of adverse events, including pneumonia. ICS is for exacerbation prevention, and Sarah has not had any for several years, according to her and her medical records. Recommendations for de-escalation or switching from a LABA plus an inhaled corticosteroid to a LABA plus a LAMA are provided in the gold strategy document. De-escalation should be considered if there's a lack of clinical benefit, if side effects occur, or if some of the symptoms resolve. Switching from a LABA plus an inhaled corticosteroid to a LABA plus a LAMA should be considered if the original indication for ICS was inappropriate. When the patient is non-responsive to inhaled corticosteroids or if side effects warrant discontinuation. In general, inhaled corticosteroid-containing therapy is recommended for patients with a blood eosinophil count of 300 cells per microliter or more, two or more exacerbations in the past year, or hospitalization for a COPD exacerbation, despite appropriate long-acting bronchodilator therapy or a history of asthma. That's why I ordered the CDC with differential to check Sarah's eosinophil count. Her eosinophil count was less than 50 cells, so I switched her to dual bronchodilator therapy with a LABA plus a LAMA. LABAs and LAMAs cause bronchodilatation by different but complementary mechanisms. LABAs activate beta-2 adrenergic receptors in smooth muscle of airways, which trigger cellular pathways and relaxation of the airway smooth muscle and bronchodilatation. LAMAs, on the other hand, inhibit muscarinic receptors and reduce contraction of airway smooth muscle. Before Sarah left my office, I asked her to schedule a follow-up visit in three to four weeks so we could assess how the new therapy was working. Meantime, my nursing staff called Sarah a week after a visit to ensure she got the prescribed inhaler, understood how to use it, and didn't have any questions. In viewing this presentation, I hope you've learned a little bit more about how to evaluate and what to consider in a patient with COPD.